they supposed to have a lot of people here. Um, so we're just going to start with intros in the chat um, because we don't have time to go around. And I just want to know your name and where you're currently located. I am Ariel Vincent, and I'm currently located in Dallas. Mm -hmm. I can't even find the chat. Kim is in Indianapolis, Ravni is in Philly, Jasmine, Indianapolis. These are all my friends, half of them. <laughs> the ones in Indianapolis are my friends. Miriam, Cherry Hill, Chan from Atlanta. Perfect. Okay, so we only have an hour. <laughs> so I'm going to get right to it and people come in where they come in. Um, so we're going to start with what inspired this class, which is uh, Dyscalculia, I am blurred, by Camon Felix. And I'm just going to read um, a couple of paragraphs. And it's about, it's called A Love Story of Epic Miscalculation. And it's about um, her navigating heartbreak, but also her navigating um, being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I kept saying to her, to my friends, to anyone who would listen, I feel like I am going to die. And it was like no one heard what I said. I kept saying how my heart is on fire and I don't think I can breathe. I called out of work, told my boss that I was sick, achy, didn't tell her with what. Really, what was there to say? What I needed was sleep, not pity. When I got into the office the next day, I decided to be honest, Tell her I was going through an earth shattering transition. It was not going to be well. With empathy as real as a hallmark Basquiat, she encouraged me to throw myself into work as a distraction, reminding me that pain is tentative and will pass if you ignore it. So that inspired this class because I think we're always encouraged to ignore our heartbreak. Um, and then from an interview with the author, I'll link that here. Thank you everyone for continuing to tell me where you are. I love it. Um, she said, the heartbreak cliche is Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet, sure, but it's also black women not knowing how to process heartbreak and needing self-guidance and figuring out how they actually feel. You're not supposed to participate in cliches and getting my heart broken in the way that it had been broken and me being broken in the way that I was felt extremely cliche. Then I was like, but I'm not a white woman. So if I am participating in a cliche, where is it? Where is the cliche? The closest that I've ever gotten to seeing a real analysis or breakdown of black women being heartbroken and in pain is waiting to exhale, but where else is it? So I wanted us to start with that, that little passage because that's what we'll be thinking about as we continue through the class. I'm now going to share my screen. And we're going to listen to one of my favorite Heartbreak songs. Okay, I need to make sure you all can't see the, the lesson plan. <laughs> okay, so we're going to listen to this and then we'll talk about it for a few. Let's check the settings on the. Hold on. Okay, there we go. Let me share with the audio. My bad, y'all. I am clearly not a millennial. Okay. Can I get a thumbs up? Okay. So how do we think if you have an hour this oh week, goodness. you're killing a hundred songs on the piano. Jesus, you too. So how do we think Solange is talking about heartbreak or confronting heartbreak in this song? You can write in the chat. You can unmute. Uh, if, if it appears in the beginning, there's a distraction. Like similar to the uh, passage, or sort of like work yourself away, work it away, and distract. Um, in the song, drink, smoke, 
read um, until so this journey into the body, which I find mm. like there's this you know visual sort of embodiment that is sort of she's inviting you to or sharing with you um, about that that process to getting there. Right, right. That's that's perfect. Anyone else want to add to that? Thank you, Christian. I I agree, right? We're looking at the coping mechanisms. What what is she or the speaker of the song using to distract themselves from the heartbreak? And I love, I'm gonna share um, the link to the lyrics here. I love that the first few lines are, I tried to drink it away. I tried to put one in the air. I tried to dance it away. I tried to change it with my hair. We never say heartbreak in this song. She could have said, I tried to drink heartbreak away, but she didn't, and that is a choice, right? But even though she does not use the word heartbreak, she's still confronting her heartbreak when talking about the coping mechanisms and the distractions um, that she uses to get over it or try to get over it. Any other thoughts on this song? I know most of y'all know it. Chan says, also talking about how she intentionally avoids dealing with hard feelings, a refusal to be vulnerable. I love that you use the word refusal because that's that's exactly how I listen to the song and how I understand the song. It It's a list of all the ways that I am trying to stay away from really digging into the heartbreak. It's a, it's a way for me to name it without naming it and to confront it without really confronting it. Anyone else? I would like to add, Ari, <laughs> um, I think for the Black community, especially Black women, that we're just kind of taught not to be emotional or to be able to express how we're feeling overall. So yeah, those distractions definitely... I'm like, huh, I did like, you know, like 80% of those yeah. <laughs> for sure. So um, I guess with with the song, it kind of like brings a conversation of how is there a healthy way to be able to feel the feels, you know? Right. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we, a lot of us have walked down those paths, but especially as Black women, we've walked those paths of okay, I cannot put a name to the hurt because like we heard in this in this passage of the book, we have to get over it. We have to move on. We have to quickly continue. Um, and that that goes for most people, you know, like we don't usually, we don't take time off from work usually to wallow in our heartbreak. Maybe if we have some extra PTO, but for the most part, we don't get that. Uh, we don't get that privilege. And I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, I was very interested in the in the sequence of the song that mm -hmm. it started out, as Christian said, with these, um, you know, very kind of um, sort of societally not acceptable, but the kind of ways that people distract themselves, sort of addictive behavior, credit card, running up credit card bills and things like that. And then it moves to this almost a sense of, OK, but then maybe I can escape by traveling, like becoming someone else, going somewhere else, not having my lover push, you know, be just almost redefining yourself. But I love the way a way um, just takes on, keeps taking on new meaning through the song. And someone else mentioned about the metal clouds, um, which she keeps saying she doesn't want to feel them, but there's something about in the song when their presence comes up, we can't help feeling them. There's something about like, I think there's something in the mind with that image, like what does a metal cloud feel like? So even if she's saying that she doesn't want to feel them, by evoking that image, it's felt. So that was really interesting to me that just being able to articulate an image um, is a kind of feeling, even if you're saying you don't want to feel it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love what you're saying, sort of similar to Christian about that transformation throughout the song, because Christian noticed that coming into the body and you're noticing, you know, we've gone from the addictive behavior to the, you know, maybe I'll love it away. Maybe I'll write it away. Maybe I'll travel it away. And so that makes us question, you know, are some coping me mechanisms viewed differently than others? And of course the answer is yes, but, and, and so in what ways, you know, and what is she saying when she, when she separates those verses and she separates those behaviors? Um, 
and the metal clouds too. Thank you for bringing that up. And I see Ravni, you brought that up. Um, it's there's definitely something blocking her, but it's the what. And so when I first listened to Cranes in the Sky, I listen to the song all the time, uh, and it makes me cry. But <laughs> I Cranes in the Sky, I was thinking birds. I'm thinking we're free. But then when I hear those metal clouds, I'm like, okay, we're talking about like a physical crane that's going up a building. Mm. Um, and so and so then what does that say? And then so then are we talking about a romantic heartbreak or are we talking about a heartbreak of environment? Are we talking about a different kind of heartbreak? Anything else before we move on to our uh, writing our own things? Thank you, everyone. This is this is great. Um, so for our first writing exercise, and you can do this on pen and paper, in your phone note, on a Google Doc, however you like to write, um, in a list or a poem, what are the ways you have distracted yourself from heartbreak? And how have you avoided the feelings of heartbreak? So I'll give you all five minutes um, and I'll set a timer. And I, I wanna, before we go, Chan said, it's so interesting because I've always read the song being about depression, never associated it with heartbreak. And I, you know, I, I did too for a while and I still do, but I think, I think maybe those things are going hand in hand. It's like, maybe the heartbreak is causing the depression or maybe, and it doesn't have to be that, but I think depending on what mode or space I'm in, I read the song differently, if that makes sense. Okay, so I'm going to give you all five minutes. Let me set my timer. And then since it's such a short writing time, I'll just come back when it's time to come back. You can turn your cameras off if you'd like. You can keep them on, up to you. Okay, five minutes and I'll copy and paste that prompt in the chat.
Okay, that's time. How did everyone feel? Did it sound anything like cranes in the sky for you? <laughs> the chat, Jasmine says too much. Kimberly says 100%. Same. Mine actually sounded way worse. Way worse. Did this feel cathartic for anyone to kind of confront the distractions we used? Julian says, I was surprised to see similar sentence structures appearing in my paragraph. Hmm. Julian, I want to hear more about that. Oh, sure. Uh, I was just like, uh, in the way that Solange is, you know, I tried to do this, I tried to do that, the short sentences and that that mirroring that structure, that sentence in a list form that ended up coming out without intention in my own writing. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And then Anne, yet, Anne said, not yet cathartic, but we're getting there. Um, I wanna go back to Chan's, Chan's idea uh, that he put in the chat before we wrote. I think, I think what I think about Cranes in the Sky is that it's a song about grief. Um, and I think heartbreak is a form of grief. And so maybe that is why I use Cranes in the Sky as a heartbreak song. Um, because to me, when you're dealing in heartbreak, we are talking about the things we're grieving. Because, you know, it's not always our romantic relationship. You know, it could be a friendship. It could be we're grieving a job or we're grieving, you know, a past career self. We can, we can grieve a lot of things. And so I think when I, when I talk about confronting and making space for heartbreak, I have sneakily made this a class about confronting and making space for grief. Um, so thank you for joining. <laughs> so our next writing exercise, and let me copy and paste this in the chat. And I think I'll do four minutes for this first one, and then we'll do one right after that. Write your heartbreak in the things you're grieving as if you're telling a stranger in an elevator. So whatever details you would give them. And I will give you all four minutes. I'm going to start that timer now.
All right, that's time. I'll ask how you feel after the second part. Now I want you to write your heartbreak and the things you're grieving as if you're telling your best friend or the person closest to you. And we'll get four minutes for that as well. All right, that is time. Um, which one did you all like better? <laughs> the stranger or telling your best friend? You can unmute, you can tell me in the chat, whichever. Jasmine said stranger. I would like to know why. <laughs> Someone else liked it. Julian liked it. I also agree, stranger. 
Okay. Tell me more, somebody, about why Stranger was your more well, cool. Yeah. So um, it's something that I just realized that I do with like any particular trauma is that I joke about it or like make light of a situation um, because <laughs> when you the first prompt said to a stranger and it was literally like joke after joke and then you said to somebody close and everything it's like oh wow like mm -hmm. I really talk about my feelings for real for real right okay so a difference in processing or a difference in communicating mm -hmm. that's really wrong yeah yeah because I, I feel like that my close friends and family hold me more accountable to what I'm feeling versus like a stranger. Like, I mean, I ain't going to see them tomorrow or they're going to forget about me in the next right. like 10 minutes, you know? So just uh -huh, we kiki kiki about it, you know? And Jasmine agreed. When we leave, I pray to never see them again. I can bear my soul to someone who won't hold me accountable, bring it up or won't it, it won't follow me. And Chan said, I spoke in metaphors to the stranger and more directly to my loved one. I like the thought of metaphors. Like, so we have the jokes, we have the metaphors. So we're kind of coming around, um, coming around the bend. And I think to go back to cranes in the sky, not, it, not that it was exactly a metaphor, but I mean, when we talked about those metal clouds, I think the elevator, the stranger in the elevator are your, you know, you can tell what your metal clouds are by how you're speaking to someone you don't know about that heartbreak or about that grief. Um, Anne says, mine was the opposite. With the stranger, I gave more specific details. Like I was telling a story with my loved one. I went directly to feeling, oh, which led to metaphors for pain. Hmm. So, Anne, you were more like, hey, so I just got my heart broken and it happened on Monday and right. And then your, your close or loved one was about how you felt about the heartbreak versus the story itself. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. And then it was sort of like coming up. Then I found myself thinking about, you know, right. metaphors for, right, and how your heart feels and how another that other person's heart feels and things like that. Yeah. So yeah, it was interesting. I love this. I love that it was almost a different experience for everyone. Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to? This is a long shot. Does anyone want to share one of their one of their prompts? I can, because again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, my gosh. Um, and so for the one, the first prompt, my, what first came to mind was my baby daddy left me for dead when I had our son. It's very ghetto out here. Literally. I'm going to mute. <laughs> Literally oh, this, that. Is my, this is my best friend, so. Yeah, yeah. So, um, hi. Um, but yeah, and then my other prompt was like completely different. So, okay. So you you literally went right into it, and like I, but I'm not curious, but I I'm interested in the fact that even with the the stranger one, you went right into, you know, it sounds like a joke, but at the same time, you went right into what happened versus I don't like if I was talking to a stranger. I don't know. I don't, and I'm trying not to do these prompts so I don't come back on the screen crying. Um, but, <laughs> but but I, I it's interesting to me that you went right into it um, with the stranger versus like, if we think about cranes in the sky, we have that it, we don't know who hurt her. We don't know when that happened. We just know that something has happened and it could be heartbreak. It could be grief. It could be depression, but we just know that something happened and she's been trying to distract herself and not exactly what happened. So that's, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the other prompt, and it's real quick, uh, for the close friends, family, I said, I feel sad and embarrassed and angry all over again every time I think about it. Mm -hmm. I grieve for my son due to me not being able to bring him into this world in better conditions. So, right. Again. So more specificity there. Yeah. And, and like the feelings, you actually say it. Thank you for sharing with with a, a virtual room full of strangers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so we are going to move on. There is a poem I want to share. I don't know that it's a poem, but it's, we're going to call it a poem. Um, and I'll share it here in the chat, but I'll also share my screen and read it aloud. 
and then we'll do some more writing. There's no sound. I am the sound this time. So this is from, um, oh my God, the whole entire Zoom is in the way. Okay. This is from For Colored Girls um, Who Have Considered Suicide slash From the Rainbow is Enough by Ntozaki Shante. She's a playwright. She's a poet. Um, and some of you may have seen the Tyler Perry movie, um, but this is a portion from that. Somebody almost walked off with all of my stuff and didn't care enough to send a note home saying I was late for my solo conversation or two sizes too small for my own tacky skirts. What can anybody do with something of no value on an open market? Did you get a dime for my things? Hey man, where are you going with all of my stuff? This is a woman's trip and I need my stuff to ooh and ah about. Honest to God, somebody almost ran off with all of my stuff and I didn't bring anything but the kick and sway of it. The perfect ass for my man and none of it is theirs. This is mine. Juanita's own things. That's my name. Now give me my stuff. I see you hiding my laugh and how I sit with my legs open sometimes to give my crotch some sunlight. This is some delicate leg and whimsical kiss. I gotta have to give my choice. So you can't have me unless I give me away. And I was doing all that till you ran off on a good thing. And who is this you left me with? Some simple bitch with a bad attitude. I want my things. I want my arm with the hot iron scar. I want my leg with the flea bite. Yeah, I want my things. I want my callous feet and quick language back in my mouth. I want my own things. How I loved them. Somebody almost ran off with all of my stuff and I was standing there looking at myself the whole time. It wasn't a spirit that ran off with my stuff. It was a man whose ego walked around like Rodin's shadow. It was a man faster than my innocence. It was a lover I made too much room for. Almost ran off with all my stuff and the one running with it don't know he got it. I'm shouting, this is mine. And he don't even know he got it. My stuff is the anonymous ripped off treasure of the year. Did you know somebody almost got away with me? Me in a plastic bag under his arm. Me, Juanita Sims, somebody almost walked off with all of my stuff. So how do you all feel that that poem is uh, confronting heartbreak? What is she doing that is different than what Solange did in Cranes in the Sky? She's, she's angry. She's, you know, she's expressing anger more than um sorrow absolutely she's she's going off <laughs> yeah well, woo child she sound like me right now <laughs> <laughs> how else do we think she's confronting heartbreak here it, it's, there's this like sense of um like unevenness mm. and um there's a and this is something i struggle with as a man a black man mm -hmm. uh, and with black women, someone who dates black women mm -hmm. and understanding the like, the sort of like, what might be also a common goal, but a, also like a very different experience of the same thing. Okay. And like, how, like, how is it so easy for one person to walk away and for another person to suffer and like to hold that and like why is that what does it mean about being a black woman what does it mean about being a black man um it makes me think of uh sula yeah when um i mean all of sula but like especially ajax when he leaves um and sula's like i didn't even know your name mm. and you know, this is, and, and so there's this kind of like, you know, how, and it always brings the point is like, how do you bridge that gap in in love, in sex, in intimacy of like, where we're experiencing the same thing? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the question of the hour. <laughs> <laughs> were we experiencing the same things, right? Because- because one of the lines uh, that stuck out to me, and this is this is a passage that I love, I always have, but reading it again at this age versus when I first encountered it, um, 
I'm shouting, this is mine. And he don't even know he got it. So was, you know, and so that, that does make us question, was the relationship the same for both people? But then also it makes us question the heaviness, you know, let's say this person who walked away is also heartbroken or also was not happy to leave. You know, it questions the weight of, of the heartbreak for each person. Um, and, and I love, Anne, what you said about the anger too, because this is so different than cranes in the sky. I think cranes in the sky feels like we have already acknowledged that this is heartbreak or depression or grief. Um, we've already, you know, we already have put a name to it. Whereas this feels like, I just realized somebody walked off with me and I almost didn't notice. I just realized that my heart is broken. What else do we think about this? Um, this excerpt I'll say and how it confronts heartbreak. Um, Chan had something in the chat and uh, let me pull it back up. She's placing the source of her heartbreak on someone else. Um, so kind of like what Kristen said too, there's, there's, I don't want to say a lack of responsibility, but I guess that we can say that for now. There's a lack of accountability for, you know, dealing with this person who maybe was egotistic enough to walk off with her. Um, he is the only person to blame. And we don't learn too much about her except for what she has to offer. Um, yeah, I, I think that, um, absolutely. I think that there was this um, idea that, especially with In Cranes in the Sky, Solange was very much like self-reflective, like, you know, this is how I was trying to process this pain, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm trying to avoid these feelings. I mean, while um, Juanita, the voice in the poem, is very much like, you know, um, is very much like, it, it's still self-reflective, but also like, you know, like she is beginning to, you can see the breakdown of her, like coming to terms with the heartbreak. Um, and it's less um, self-reflective. And I guess Solange's was a bit passive and more active. Like this has happened to me, these things, you know, or is currently happening to me. I am beginning to realize the breakdown that has happened in my body and in my space and with the relationship that I had with this person. And I'm pissed about it. Um, and you can kind of, you get the sense that she's actively about to do something to, mm -hmm. to, to, to kind of, you know, intervene her heartbreak. Right. Like she's, she, this is the step, this is a couple steps before where Solange has, where Solange is in Cranes in the Sky. This is, like you said, okay, I, I realize what happened. I need to intervene. I need to reclaim myself. Yeah. So and there's also this interesting way that she, um, it's like, you know, this idea of being taken, like the way that they talk about, you know, if that's feel first, you know, she kind of literalizes it's her stuff. And then gradually in the course of it, it's sort of like it's her, it's her identity that's been stolen. It's her sense of self. And I like that there's this way that he first, it's like there are parts of her that she feels good about herself and he takes those, but it's also like she wants to reclaim the parts that maybe like her callous feet and stuff like that, all of it, which maybe he insulted her or maybe it was just like if he takes he just can't have any bit of her i don't know they're like different ways you could read that but it's an interesting um it's this idea of wholeness you know that he's he wants to steal something from her um and there's a sense that he defined her in a certain way that she conformed to and she's taking that all back right um, yeah so. exactly and i feel like you know she's like now that she notices oh he he ran off with all of me let me start loving even these calloused feet yeah even this you know the way i sit with my crutch open <laughs> <laughs> right. you know like it it it's a re recognizing who she is what she has to offer but also everything about herself even the things that she maybe doesn't love or he didn't love um i love that you brought that up yeah. And that she's not dependent on him, which is kind of angry, but it's also like a, I mean, that, that's an angry response, but it's also a healthy response to say, uh, my, my self-worth is not dependent on 
whether he loves me or not. Right. And I, I also want to say something about the title here, um, or I guess the title is somebody almost walked off with all of my stuff. And I want us to think about the almost, we're going to go into one last exercise. Um, but I want us to think about that almost because I read it, even though I hear that I read it as he ran off <laughs> with her stuff, definitely. But mm-hmm. she's like, he almost ran off. So what does mm-hmm. that, what does that mean for us? Um, as we process this and think about her heartbreak and her grief and her anger. Christian says this idea and fear of being disposable, but also fighting against it tooth and nail. Yes, she's saying, listen, I'm not going anywhere. He has me in a plastic bag under his arm. He almost walked off with me, but I didn't let him throw me away. So we're going to go into last exercise. I know we're short on time. Um, so we're going to do three minutes and three minutes. This one is going to be right about who you were before the heartbreak and what they took. We'll do three minutes for that. And then I'll come back with another for the next three. Okay, time's up, and I'm going to put the second part in the chat. So this time, you'll write who you are after the heartbreak and what you've gained or regained. If you haven't gotten over that bridge of your heartbreak yet, I want you to imagine it. I'll give you three minutes.
Okay, that is time, and we are near the end of class. We, well, this is the end of class. Um, I hope that felt good for you all. I hope you imagined some, some things after your heartbreak. Um, I want to leave you with a quote from Bell Hook's book, All About Love. Being loving does not mean we will not be betrayed. Love helps us face betrayal without losing heart and it renews our spirit so we can love again. So I know we we dug deep in this class um, for it to be an hour in the middle of the workday, um, but I hope after this class, even if you don't feel ready to love again or trust again or whatever, because we, we're not just talking about romantic heartbreak, um, that you at least feel comfortable starting to confront what's been holding you back. Um, if you loved this class, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and threads at Ari Writes. That's A-R-R-I Writes. Um, and next year in February for anti-Valentine's Day, I'm teaching a longer version of this class um, with Write or Die, and I'll be posting about it. Um, but I, if I put the link here, you'll lose it. So <laughs> um, yes, Ari Writes, and you'll find any classes that I'm teaching there or at my website, which is AriWrites.com. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, so you. Much. Uh, thank you, Ariel. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated in today's session. Uh, I've shared a few links uh, about Blue Stoop in the chat. You can learn more about Blue Stoop programs. And there's also a, a brief survey about today's session, which you should definitely do. Um, <laughs> so thank you for being here. Thank you to Ariel for these thoughtful prompts. Uh, I learned a lot. I hope you did too. So take care and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Go Phillies. <laughs> okay, sports. Thanks, everyone.